um, sorry, just clicking this thing here. Yeah, so, sorry, because I cannot see my mouse. So what happened here? Hmm. Sorry about that, just a second. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, sorry about that. So I would like to thank the organizers very much for inviting me to give a, a talk in this uh, very nice seminar and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about some uh, fairly recent results or the complexity of uh, three uh, fairly well-known problems, um, the necklace splitting problem, the consensus halving problem, and the discrete ham sandwich problem that Igor mentioned. And these results are from two papers that I wrote uh, jointly with Paul Goldberg. So you can see him there uh, in the picture. And these papers were published at Stock in 2018 and 2019. So let me start um, with the definition of the first of the three problems that appears in the title of the talk. And that one is the necklace splitting problem. And for most of this presentation, when I will be referring to the necklace splitting problem, I will be referring to the version with two thieves. Um, so in this version, we have um, an open necklace. So you can think of it as a string. And um, on this necklace, we have um, a number of beads of n different colors. And actually, let's say that we have an even number of beads from each color. Um, the objective here is to cut the necklace using n cuts as, num as same, the same number of cuts as the name as the, sum as the, sorry, in the number of colors. Um, and then we assign a label to each of the pieces, either A or B. And you can think of these labels as being the names of the thieves that I will actually get each piece. Um, and the goal is to do it in such a way uh, that um, both thieves get the same number of beads from each color. So for every color, every thief gets half of the beads. So an example is something like this here, sorry. Something like this here. So we have A and B and uh, if you look at it, then every thief gets the same number of beads. So this problem actually has a, a rather long history and it was most uh, notably studied by Alon in 1987. And I wasn't aware that Professor Alon would be in the audience today, which is really good. Um, but actually the version with two thieves that I, uh, that I mentioned earlier and that will be present for most of this presentation was studied even before that uh, in, a, in a paper in 1986. I think, I believe that the name necklace splitting uh, originated first in this earlier paper in, in 1982. But if we look for versions of this problem, slightly different versions of this problem, then we go back in time uh, to the 1960s and actually even back to the 1940s and this paper by name. Now, what, this, what makes this problem particularly interesting is, is that it has an inherent characteristic and that is that it, it is a total problem. That means that the solution to this problem always exists. Regardless of how you place the beads on the necklace, you know, their colors and so on, um, then uh, there is always a solution. You can always find a solution that satisfies the constraints of the necklace splitting problem. And the proof goes by, the, by, by a well-known theorem, a very old theorem in mathematics, the Borsuk-Ulam theorem. It's not important to remember what the Borsuk-Ulam theorem is. It will not appear again. Um, well, it will appear a few times throughout the talk, but it's not important to remember the definition. For completeness, I have it here. So it states that if you have a continuous function from the n-dimensional sphere to the uh, n-dimensional space of real vectors, then this function has a fixed point, meaning there is an x such that f of x is equal to f of minus x. Okay. Um, well, now that we know that a solution exists, what is the next step? Well, the next natural question is, can we find this solution? Um, and um, even more so, the question is, can we find it efficiently? Can we find it in polynomial time? And um, I have an extract here from uh, a 1990 paper by Professor Alon, where he said, you know, I think I would interpret this, this extract here as 
you know, some kind of cautious optimism that this might be the case. That was back, back in the 90s, actually. But despite all that, um, we don't really have uh, such an algorithm for the problem that I presented. There are some very nice, interesting recent results if you relax the problem a little bit and you can do stuff in polynomial time. But for this problem, using the same number of cuts as the, as the number of colors, we don't know of any such algorithm. And actually after the result that I will present today, it's unlikely that we will actually find any such algorithms. Okay, so moving on to the second problem that appears in the title of my talk, and that is the consensus halving problem. So that one, in that one, we have a set of N agents and these agents have valuation functions over a resource or an interval. And for the purpose of this presentation, you can just assume that these are piecewise constant functions or step functions, and they're given by their length and their height. So on the left here, you see an example where we have three agents, so a different color represents a different agent, and they have these valuation blocks that constitute their valuation functions. The goal is to cut the interval into pieces again, using as many cuts as the number of agents. And then we assign a label to each piece, either plus or minus. And we want to do it in such a way that every agent, according to their own valuation function, believes that the total amount of plus and the total amount of minus uh, is worth the same. And uh, although this problem was not started for the first time by Simmons and Sue, it was started before that actually, um, I chose to have this paper here as a reference because this is where the name originated. So Simmons and Sue actually called this problem consensus often in their 2003 paper. Um, again, this is a total problem as you might have guessed. Um, a solution with n cuts is guaranteed to exist and this can be proven using the borsa coulomb theorem. And it's easy to see that if you have fewer cuts, then a solution is not guaranteed to exist. So the totality of the problem goes away. Uh, and you can see that um, by this very simple example, we have four agents for different valuation blocks. There have to be cuts intersecting all the blocks. Otherwise, it's not possible to satisfy, satisfy them all at the same time. Now, actually, uh, as I said, Simmons and Sue were not the first to study the approximate version of the problem, sorry, the exact version of the problem but I believe they were the first to study the approximate version of the problem, the epsilon consensus halving problem or the approximate consensus halving problem. And this is also the version that we will be concerned with in this, in this, in this uh, presentation. So what is the definition of the approximate version? It's fairly straightforward. Instead of requiring that every agent is completely happy with the balance between the plus and the minus, we can allow for a small discrepancy of epsilon and additive uh, error parameter. So this is the approximate consensus of the problem. Again, we know that a solution exists. This is a total problem, but can we find this solution? Is there an efficient algorithm for finding a solution for this problem? And actually, if we look at the proof by Simmons and Sue for the approximate version, this is a constructed proof. So it does give us an algorithm. It's just that this algorithm is not a polynomial time algorithm. And actually, if you think about it for a bit, you might actually realize that consensus halving is a continuous analog of necklace splitting with two thieves. So these problems are actually inherently related. And when I said before that uh, existence of necklace splitting for two thieves is proven using the uh, borsal coulomb theorem, what I actually mean is that you go by the continuous version. So you prove that consensus halving uh, actually has a solution always via the Borsal Coulomb and from there you can prove necklace splitting. And this is because consensus halving is a more general problem than necklace splitting in a sense. And uh, this is an example demonstrating roughly why this is the case. So this is the necklace that I showed you before. So we have the beads there. What I will do is that I will substitute the beads by some valuation blocks, uniform valuation blocks like this. So I substitute all of them with evaluation block of the appropriate color corresponding to the appropriate agent. And then this actually looks like a consensus halving instance, a simple one. Consensus halving can be more general. These value functions can be much more complicated, but this is definitely a consensus halving instance. So if we solve this, we can also solve necklace splitting. Now there is an asterisk to this because the solution that we obtain here might actually got, cut through the pieces. So you need an argument afterwards where you can move the cuts around a bit inductively but this is also a standard argument that is present in Professor Alon's uh, 1987 paper. 
Okay, so this is not that this is an interesting thing, but the most interesting part is that we can actually actually also go the other way. Now we can prove the consensus halving. Uh, we can prove that a solution to epsilon consensus halving exists by coming up with a solution for necklace splitting. And the rough idea is the following. So we have the instance of consensus halving there. You see the valuation blocks. And then we will simulate every, simula every valuation block with a number of beads. And the denser the valuation blocks, the more beads we will put in there. Then we will solve necklace splitting and we will use this set of cuts to get an approximate solution to consensus halving. So there are two things to remember here. First, for this to work, it has to be that consensus halving um, has valuations that are piecewise constant, like the one shown here. And secondly, the approximation parameter epsilon has to be inversely polynomial in the size of the input. Uh, that might seem like a detail at this point, but it will become relevant later throughout the presentation. So I'll come back to this. So what we have in terms of complexity is that in order to prove some computational hardness for necklace spl splitting, via this reduction, it suffices to prove a computational hardness for our epsilon consensus half. Okay, and this brings me to the last, um, the last uh, problem that appears in the title of my talk, and this is a discrete ham sandwich problem. So what we have here is uh, we have these sets of points, endpoints in d-dimensional Euclidean space. And let's assume that the cardinality of each one of, of, of each of these sets is, uh, is even. And we want to find a hardware plane that splits all of these sets in half. So something like this. So we represent every set uh, with a color and you know, on one of the half spaces we have half of the points and on the other half space we have half of the points and that is true for every color. This is also a very old uh, problem. It actually dates back to the 1930s, although this is the continuous version where we have measures instead of points. And it has been studied over the years both in mathematics, but also in computer science. And again, as you might've guessed, this is a total problem. So a solution always exists and this can be proven using the Borsuk-Lang theorem again. So this is a kind of a common characteristic of all of these problems that you can prove them using the Borsuk-Lang theorem. And this is not a coincidence. Now, what I would like to show is uh, how you can get from discrete ham sandwich to necklace splitting. And this is also an idea that was um, presented before in several papers. So what you do is that you consider the moment curve. So, which is exactly what you see there. It's alpha, alpha squared, alpha to the D in the dimensions for some alpha that is between zero and one. And if you think of a, if you think about it in two dimensions, it looks like this, like this string here, this tilted string. Then we look at the necklace. And then for each bead, we look at the distance between the bead and the left end point of the necklace. And let's say that this distance is alpha, then we find the corresponding point on the moment curve and we place a bit of that color there. So in two dimensions, you can think of it as taking the, the necklace and kind of tilting it like this. And then it looks uh, like what you see in the picture, which is placing all the beads on the moment curve. So what we do afterwards is that we solve this using the ham sandwich theorem, the solution to ham sandwich, and we find the separating hyperplane. And everything that is above the hyperplane goes to one of the thieves and everything that is below goes to the other. And the reason why this works is because we know that any hyperplane intersects the moment curve in at most D points, which means that we will never use more than D cuts to do this. So from this, we can get a solution uh, to necklace splitting. Where am I going with this? Well, what I would like to say is that beside this bullet that I mentioned earlier, we also have this that in order to prove computational hardness for the discrete ham sandwich problem, it actually suffices to prove computational hardness for necklace splitting. And putting these things together, it actually suffices to prove computational hardness for epsilon consensus halving, and then we get hardness for all of these interesting problems. So this is the setup. And this brings me to this slide that I call the state of the world. And I will be coming back to the slide and I will be actually populating this slide with new information but this is the state of the world. The things that we knew for many years is that all of these problems always have solutions. Okay, now let's talk about complexity. And in order to talk about complexity, I have to talk about the appropriate complexity classes. And here we have a problem for which a solution always exists. 
So what is an appropriate class? In 1991, Megiddo and Papadimitriou defined a class which is called TFNP, which stands for total search problems in NP. Total meaning that they always have a solution. And the other characteristic is that given a solution, we can check efficiently in polynomial time that this is actually a solution. And this is also a characteristic of all the three problems that I mentioned. So they are all in the class TFNP. Now, there are some issues with the class TFNP for several reasons that I will not mention here. It's not easy to work with. We do not expect to have TFNP complete problems. So what Papa Dimitriou did subsequently in a different paper in 1994 is that he defined many other classes, subclasses of TFNP, trying to somehow categorize different problems based on their complexity. So I believe that his vision was that with these subclasses of TFNP, he would capture the precise complexity of many interesting problems for which we do not, we do not know the complexity of. One subclass of TFNP that is of particular interest to us for this talk is PPA. You might have heard of this class before, maybe not. Um, it's defined uh, in terms of the canonical problem which is called leaf and which I will actually define in a few slides. Now, if you haven't heard of PPA, you might have heard of PPAD. Um, PPAD is also defined with respect to a canonical problem, which is called end of line, and has been, been, has been made famous for some reasons that I will mention in the next slide. Before I do that, let me also mention that TFNP actually has uh, many other interesting subclasses, and there is a lot of work, ongoing work, recent work, very interesting work on these subclasses. So if you're looking for uh, new problems to work in complexity, then I would suggest that this is a very fruitful uh, and open area where you can actually get some very nice results. And there are some uh, big open problems to solve. So speaking of PPAD, uh, PPAD became very successful because uh, um, in 2009, and actually before that for the conference version, uh, Paul Goldberg, together with uh, Kostis Daskalakis and uh, Christos Papadimitriou, uh, showed that computing a Nash equilibrium which is a fundamental, a very fundamental concept in economics is uh, complete for this class. And this result was complemented by a paper by Chen Den and Tang that showed the same thing for, for two players. And of course, this paper won several awards where the, it won the 2011 CM Outstanding Paper Prize, the Kalai Prize from the Game Theory Society. Uh, Kostis Daskalak has won an ACM doctoral dissertation award for this paper and also uh, this contributed to many of the awards that he won over the years. And actually, I have to say that if you look at this picture there, this paper actually received coverage from the mainstream media in Greece. Uh, Kostis actually was uh, present in uh, television, like television networks, mainstream TV, talking about these things. And I don't know about you, but it's not every day that you see a theoretical computer science on, on national TV, right? So that was quite good. Now, I looked if something like this happened in the UK, but I couldn't find anything from a, a quick Google search. So I guess maybe in Greece, uh, the mainstream media are more interested in, uh, in game theory rather than in the UK, but you know, that's my conjecture. Anyway, uh, let's now get to some definitions of these classes just to make sure that we all understand what they are. So PPAD is defined with respect to a canonical problem which is called end of line. So what we have here as input is an exponentially large graph uh, this graph is directed and every vertex has in degree and now degree at most one. And we're given uh, a source and we're asked to find another source or a sink. Now, of course, uh, if the graph was given to us explicitly, that would be a trivial problem. However, the graph is given to us via access to two circuits, two Boolean circuits for the successor of a node and the predecessor of a node. And we can query the circuit, we can get the result and then we can search through the graph. So as an example, let's say that we start from the source that is given to us, and then we ask for the predecessor and the successor. There is no predecessor. We find the successor. Maybe we have another node there somewhere. We query this one. We find the predecessor and the successor. Um, maybe then another one. And somehow we may find uh, here's a sink. So maybe we have found this sink. And this is the whole graph here that we don't actually see. Uh, so the point is, if something, uh, if something can be um, cast as an end-of-line instance, then it kind of implies that there is a path-following algorithm uh, for finding it, for finding a solution. 
Now PPA is defined very similarly, but the canonical problem is called leaf. It's defined on an undirected graph. Every vertex has degree at most two. We're given a leaf and we need to find another leaf. And now we don't have a predecessor and a successor. We just have a circuit that returns all the neighbors. So it's a very similar definition. And now in terms of complexity, PPAD, if you're wondering about the name, uh, this officially stands for polynomial parity argument on a directed graph. And uh, a problem is in the class, if it can be reduced to end of line, and if end of line can be reduced to this problem, then it's also complete for the class. And for PPA, we have the very same thing, but the graph is not directed. And the uh, um, reductions are from and to uh, the canonical problem leaf. Okay, now let's get back to the complexity of these three problems. And let's ask ourselves, what, what did we know about the complexity of these problems? Well, the first observation is that they are all in PPA. And this should not be surprising because they can be proven using the Borsukulam theorem and the Borsukulam computational problem has been shown to be in PPA. Um, this was already observed by Papa Dimitri. It was stated there, it was not formally proven. Uh, I believe that the first uh, formal proof of uh, um, PPA membership for consensus halving and therefore for necklace splitting as well is in uh, this paper that we wrote together with Paul and Sren Fredrickson and Jia Zhang. But I have to say that we didn't do much for this result there because it's essentially taking Simonson's proof, which is already almost an MPPA result. You just have to formalize it in terms of a reduction. Now, discrete ham sandwich is also in PPA. That appears to be folklore. Uh, we have written um, a proof in the appendix of our 2019 paper, but we don't really get uh, take credit for this. The big question here is, was, was actually the hardness of these problems. Were they also complete for the class PPA? That was the big question. And coming back to the state of the world, we also, also already kind of knew that all of these problems are in PPA. Now, in order to prove computational hardness, we have to actually look at what kind of problems do we have to reduce from? Which are the PPA complete problems that we can use to obtain a reduction? And that actually brings up something quite interesting uh, about these classes, PPAD uh, as opposed to PPA. Now, here on the left, I have listed some problems that have been shown to be complete for PPAD over the years. And as you can see, we have some computational versions of well-known topological theorems like Sperner, Brouwer, and Kakutani. We have Nash that I mentioned earlier. We have uh, several versions of computing uh, market equilibria in exchange economies. And even some very general versions of NV free k cutting can actually be proven to be complete for PPAD, have been proven to be complete for PPAD. And there are many more. So in that sense, if Papa Dimitriou's vision was to define these classes to capture the precise complexity of many interesting problems, I think that PPAD has been largely successful in that regard. For PPA, unfortunately, we could not say the same thing. Up until recently, the only problems that we knew to be complete for PPA were problems that basically appear on the left that were somewhat artificially uh, defined on non-orientable spaces. So you get rid of the orientation and you get a PPA completeness result instead. Recently, some papers like uh, two-dimensional Tucker, Borsukulam and octahedral Tucker were shown to be complete for this class as well. But this is only recently. Um, there's actually another characteristic um, that applies to all of the problems on the right though. And this is if we look into their definition, let's say for Sperner, it starts a little bit like this. So we consider a triangulated simplex and then there is a polynomial time machine or a polynomial size circuit that assigns labels to the vertices of the triangulation. If we look at Tucker, for instance, then again, we start from some triangulated hypergrid. It doesn't matter. You don't have to, to know what this is. What is important is that the labeling function is given via means of a polynomial size circuit. But actually as early as uh, Papa Dimitriou's original paper, 94, he asked the question of whether we can find problems that are complete for PPA that do not exhibit this property, that do not have a circuit uh, explicitly em embedded in their definition. And the same question was reiterated by Greeny in 2001. And he called these problems natural. So he, he used the term natural to refer to problems that do not have a circuit in their definition. And finally, uh, Eisenberg, Bonnet and Boos in a very recent paper, although the first version appeared in 2015, uh, they asked this question again, whether we can find 
natural problems are complete for PPA. Um, here, I just have to mention one thing that this is one definition of natural problems. Uh, Paul also actually in his uh, 2019 talk in uh, the Algo UK workshop gave another definition that I also find uh, quite natural, which is these are problems that are identified independently from the work of TFTP. So these are problems that we cared about for other reasons, you know, and then it happens to be that their complexity lies within these classes. Now, if we go to the state of the world, um, what we knew was that PPA was a rather lonely class. It didn't contain any natural problems until recently. And actually until the, these papers that I'm presented, presenting, there was no problem that was natural according to both definitions. But if we go back to the definition of natural problems, then we will see that necklace splitting, consensus halving, and discrete ham sandwich are natural according to both definitions. So in that sense, when we were working on these results, we thought that it would be an opportunity to hit two birds with one stone, because on the one hand, we would be able to settle the complexity of these well-known problems. And on the other hand, we would also identify the first problems that are natural for PPA. Therefore, kind of establishing PPA as a, as a class containing natural problems, actually containing complete natural problems. I have to say that it took us two stones to do this. And the reason is the following that in the first paper um, that was from stock 2018, what we proved is actually uh, given out by the title. So we proved that consensus halving is PPA complete. However, quite importantly, we only proved that when epsilon is inversely exponential. So here, if you look at epsilon, forget about all the other things, just look at epsilon, the parameter epsilon. Now, qualitatively, epsilon can be very small, let's say inversely exponential in the size of the input, it can be inversely polynomial, could also be constant. And of course, as we move from the left to the right, the problem becomes easier. It's easier to satisfy agents that can tolerate a constant error, which means that proving hardness becomes more difficult. So of course, the first step to prove any kind of hardness for this problem is to start with the easiest case, which is the inversely exponential case. And this is what we did in this paper. So coming back to the state of the world, what we managed to do is to put uh, consensus halving there, or epsilon consensus halving there is a PPA complete problem. And that was the first natural complete problem for the class. So that was the significance of that paper. However, this, is, this did, not, did not quite give us what we wanted for necklace splitting because here we'll come back to what I said in the beginning. This equivalence, this computational equivalence that I mentioned earlier only holds when epsilon is inversely polynomial. So from this result, we do not get the hardness of necklace splitting. So we had to write another paper to get this. And in that paper, we actually strengthened the hardness of consensus halving to epsilon being inversely polynomial. Now, in technical terms, that was much more difficult to do for many reasons. But the good thing about it is that it managed, so it, with this, we managed to get the corollary that um, a necklace splitting is also complete for PPA. And then, in turn, we also got the corollary that discrete ham sandwich is complete for PPA. So coming back to this slide here, um, we also put necklace splitting there as a PPA complete problem, discrete ham sandwich as well. And now we could conclusively say that PPA has a lot, no, several natural complete problems. So it is not in a natural class by any means. And coming back to this can picture. I, can, can I ask a question? Absolutely. So I only have two slides left. So do you want me to, I can answer now. We can, I can go through the slides and answer afterwards, whatever you prefer. Uh, whatever you prefer. Okay. Let, let me finish for the two slides and then I'll come back. Okay. That's okay. Okay. okay thank you. So, yeah. So what I, well, what I was saying here is that we managed to put this, uh, these problems there, consensus laughing, necklace splitting, and discrete ham sandwich. So now our PPA is uh, much less lonely in a sense. And of course, a big question here is we can have more problems that are complete for BPA. There are some very nice candidates that we don't really know how to deal with. So there are some big open problems there as well. And that brings me to the final slide as promised. And this is, uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of open problems associated with this work. I will only mention the most important one. And this has to do with uh, necklace splitting with many thieves. So up until now, I have only been talking about necklace splitting for the case of two thieves. 
but the existence holds more generally if you have many fields. So for k equals two, the problem is PPA complete. What happens about general care? What can we prove there? As I said, uh, Professor Alon's existence proof holds for any k. It does not use the Borsukulam theorem. It uses generalization of the Borsukulam theorem. But the question is what happens in terms of the complexity? And I have to say here, I have to explain that although it seems like the problem is more general because we have a larger k, we're also allowed to use more cuts. So the problem does not necessarily become harder. So uh, we have some results on this. This is a very recent paper uh, that I wrote together with uh, Alex Hollander. So Alex is a brilliant student of Paul, a PhD student of Paul, and also Katerina Sotiraki and Manol Zabatakis. And there, among other results, we managed to prove that um, necklace plating with P thieves, where P is a prime power, lies in a computational class, which is called PPAP. So PPAP, um, so this is a set of classes parameterized by the parameter P. It was defined also in Papa Dimitri's original paper in 94. And you can think of them as different versions of PPA in a sense. And uh, PPA2 is actually PPA, but you can have others as well. And I believe this is the right class, the right complexity class for this problem. Although it's a big challenge to prove uh, whether you know, we, we can have PPAP completeness. Um, so what about hardness? This is the big question here. Uh, in this uh, companion paper with the same set of authors in ECA this year, we managed to, to give some preliminary evidence uh, that this problem is hard. So it's not solvable in a polynomial time, but I would say that we're still far from, from the, the theorem that we would like to prove, the result that we would like to prove, which is precisely this. We would like to prove that necklace spending with P-thieves is complete for PPAP. And I believe that this will actually require us to use some fundamentally new techniques. There are a lot of obstacles if we try to use the things that we have used. So this is a very challenging question. Yeah, so that brings me to the conclusion of my talk. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions.